I am told by my computer that I need to quit and come back so that I can so I can share my screen with you. Um, is it the case? Maybe I can. Yeah, when I attempted okay. to share, it said uh, I had to get I had to grant Cisco WebEx meetings uh, permissions, and since so it says I won't be able to share until I quit and come back. But okay. I can do that quickly. If yes, please do so. Uh, I'll be right back. Oh, that worked. Is it working now? Yeah, this is perfect. I can share now, let's say. Mm. Can you all see this? Yes, we can see the full screen. Yes, this, this is great. Yes, I think uh, we can see the, the full screen mode and we can see the um, black arrow. If you want to point something on the screen, so I can we we can get starting. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much for having me. Um, I thought I'd spend my time today describing a couple of new tools that we've been developing for compressing a distribution more effectively than IID sampling or um, than standard Markov chain Monte Carlo thinning. And the motivation for this line of work is coming from computational cardiology. In this field, uh, scientists are developing these multi-scale digital twins of human hearts, essentially digital simulations of specific hearts. And the goal is to be able to predict your disease progression and your response to therapy without having to actually intervene in your actual heart. And this is necessarily a, a multi-scale sort of phenomenon. So for instance, if you wanna study um, heartbeats, and when heartbeats go wrong, then this is clearly a whole organ phenomenon. You know, heartbeat involves your whole heart, but it's also being coordinated by single cells at the single cell level based on something called calcium signaling. And it's known that dysregulation in this calcium signaling cycle can lead to these life-threatening heart arrhythmias, irregular heartbeats. And so there are whole lines of work just dedicated to understanding um, the impact of calcium signaling dysregulation on heart function. So let's try to understand what this looks like from an inferential standpoint. So first, we have models of how calcium signaling works in your heart, but we don't exactly know how it works. And so the models are pretty good, but we don't know everything about them. They have unknown parameters, and we have to infer those parameters or estimate them from patient data. So that's the first step. And once you've estimated these parameters, well, now you have uncertainty. And so how are you gonna capture that uncertainty? The standard way to do this is to um, sample many likely parameter configurations. So in particular, one will run Markov Chain Monte Carlo, MCMC, to eventually draw sample points from the posterior distribution over your unknown parameters. Let's call that distribution P. And already this is becoming somewhat of an expensive endeavor because this may require millions of sample points to adequately explore the target distribution P. It's often high dimensional. Okay, now, now we have uncertainty about the calcium signaling model, but we don't actually care about that. What we actually care about is your heart. We want we understand what is going to happen to your heart. And so now we need to propagate that uncertainty at the single cell level, all the way up through this whole heart level. Um, and what that means is that we need to simulate that whole heart model for each of these sampled configurations. It turns out this is super expensive because each simulation today requires thousands of CPU hours and having to do that for a million configurations is already prohibitive. So this leads one to the one of the big questions motivating this line of work, which is, can we accurately summarize a distribution like this posterior P using many fewer points? And if so, how do we do that? Okay, and so this question is at the heart of what I like to call distribution compression where the goal is to accurately summarize a distribution using a small number of points. And I think you're all familiar with the most standard solutions to this problem. Perhaps the most common is just to directly sample independently 
from your target distribution P. And in some cases you can't do that, but instead you might reach for something like MCMC to generate a Markov chain that's converging to P and that will still provide you eventually samples from that distribution. So what are the benefits of doing this, of these standard solutions? Well, the benefits are that they're readily available. They're Markov chains that you could use off the shelf for lots of target distributions, and they're eventually high quality, meaning that um, if you want to estimate an expectation under P, one of these integrals in red, you can do so using an asymptotically exact sample estimate, just an average over the sample points that you drew, that you drew from your Markov chain. But there are also some downsides. And the downsides are that the samples produced via these standard solutions are too large. The typical integration error goes down like n to the minus one half, which means to reduce your original error by 1%, you need 10,000 points already. And this sort of large sample scaling is prohibitive for these very expensive downstream tasks and for expensive function evaluations, like the, um, the whole heart simulations that we just considered. So what can we do about this? Well, we have on hand these readily available solutions. So here's one idea. What if we take this high quality sample approximation produced by MCMC and directly compress that further? In some sense, I'm saying, let's take our general distribution compression problem for any target P and turn it into a compression for an empirical distribution problem. How do we, how do we compress an empirical distribution that's already a good approximation. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you could reach for some of the same tools. You could, you could sample further from your empirical distribution, or you could use uniform subsampling. Um, in MCMC, a common thing to do is what's called standard thinning, which is just keep every teeth point of your Markov chain. And these are easy enough to do, but they typically lead to a large loss in accuracy. Your worst case integration error typically goes up by a factor of square root t. And that means if you're, if you're doing heavy compression from n points all the way down to say square root n points, then your error is blowing up from your original n to the minus one half error is blowing up to n to the minus one quarter. And that's a pretty big um, loss in accuracy. So a natural question is, can we do better than this? Can we compress better than this? And to answer that question, I think it's helpful to think about the lower bounds for this problem. So there are some minimax lower bounds known for worst case integration error to P. And one tells us that any compression procedure returning square root n points must have at least n to the minus one half error for some target distribution. A second lower bound tells us that any approximation at all to a distribution P that's based on only n IID points must again have n to the minus one half error um, for some target distribution. So these are different sorts of lower bounds, but they're both pointing us to the same number, the same rate, which is n to the minus one half. And what I want to highlight is that n to the minus one half is the error of our input uh, of our input pn. It, that is the error that we're starting with, and it's much smaller than the error that we get by doing standard thinning or IID sampling from pn. So it seems like there's some hope for improving our imp compression ability. And in this talk, what I'd like to do is introduce a more effective compression strategy, we call it kernel thinning, that matches these lower bounds up to log factors. Okay, so here's our problem setup. We're gonna start with an input point set, with, let's call that S in. It has n points, x1 through xn, they belong to r to the d. And we're gonna say the empirical distribution over these points is pn. Okay. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about where these points came from. In fact, they could be pre-generated by any algorithm at all. So they could be coming from an IID, from direct sampling. They could be coming from MCMC. But they could even be deterministically generated from a quadrature rule or a procedure like kernel herding. Wherever they come from, all we want from these points is that they provide a good approximation, a good initial approximation to P, but potentially one that is too large that we want to compress. OK. Now we also have a target output size s. You should think of s as maybe something like square root n if you're doing very heavy compression. And our goal is going to be, be to return a core set, a subset of those input points with size s. Um, 
we'll call the empirical distribution over those core set points Q. And we have some, we have some um, criteria for S, uh, for our core set. We want it to be the case that this core set provides a better approximation than IID sampling, which means in particular, the integration error, the worst case integration error between our input and our core set should be little o of s to the minus one half, because s to the minus one half is what we would get if we just drew a uniformly random subsample from our input. Okay. So this is all this is this is all good. Okay, so this is our goal, but like you know, how do we what do I mean by worst case integration error? How are we measuring the quality of our approximations? We need we need some specific quality measure. So given that we care about these worst this worst case integration error between input and core set, it's natural to consider a family of um, probability metrics called maximum mean discrepancies. And so a maximum mean discrepancy literally is a measure of the maximum discrepancy between input and core set expectations over a class of real value test functions. And today we're gonna to focus on test functions belonging to um, the unit ball of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So in this case, your MMD for short is parameterized by what's called the reproducing kernel K. Um, that's a function of two arguments that's symmetric in those two arguments and also positive semi-definite, meaning that if you evaluated the pairwise evaluations of the functions over a set of points and formed a matrix of pairwise evaluations, then that matrix is always a positive semi-definite matrix. So what's an example of such a kernel? One of the most common is this Gaussian kernel, which looks just like a Gaussian density applied to the difference of X minus Y. Another that will come up in this talk is an inverse multi-quadric kernel, which is similar to the Gaussian, except it decays like a polynomial instead of like a, a, squared, uh, a squared exponential. Okay, now it turns out that for, these, for each of these kernels that I mentioned and for many others, um, a maximum mean discrepancy actually metrizes convergence and distribution. And that's nice because it means that if you can control the MMD, you're not just controlling expectations in the RKHS, but you're actually guaranteeing that all of the expectations for any bounded continuous function is going to, um, is going to converge and be small. Okay, so there's one more element that I need to define before I can introduce the algorithm to you. It's what we like to call a square root kernel. Uh, we'll call it K root for short. And a square root kernel is just another kernel that when you integrate it against itself, gives you back the original kernel. And it turns out you can identify these square root kernels for lots of standard kernels. So if you start with a Gaussian, the square root kernel is just another Gaussian with a different bandwidth. If you start with a matern, it's another matern with a different set of parameters. If you start with a B-spline kernel, it's another B-spline. Um, and so we give lots of examples of these square root kernels in our, in our paper. And then it turns out that you don't actually need an exact square root kernel to run the algorithm that I'm going to describe. It's sufficient just to have um, a kernel that a square root kernel that dominates your kernel, and there are more details about that in our paper as well. Okay, so finally, here's the algorithm kernel fitting. It has two steps. The first step is an initialization stage. We call it KT split. In this step, what you're going to do is you're going to take your input set S in, and you're going to partition it into many candidate core sets each of size s. And each of those candidate core sets is formed by recursively dividing your input in half. So specifically what you're going to do is you're going to take all the points in your input, you're going to pair them up, and in each pair you're going to take one point to keep and one, and you're going to discard the other point. And the question is, of course, how do you choose which point to keep? Well, what you do is you consider adding each point into your core set, you see which one offers the better approximation, and then you flip a coin, you flip a random coin, and the coin is biased toward the better point. And if you do this in the right way, it turns out that the non-uniform randomness in this process ensures that the integration error between your input and your core set is small for every function in your square root kernel um, Hilbert space. And one of the main results of our work is that this in turn implies that your MMD is going to be within the log factors of the optimal one over S rate that I described before, which is much, uh, much smaller than what you would get from an IID sample. So if you just drew an IID sample of size S from your input, you'd get S to the minus one half and you, you pay that full, um, that full increase in, in, in accuracy. <laughs>
okay, so that's just step one, and this is what you get from step one. But then there's a second step, which is called the refinement step. We call it KT swap. Um, so out of the first step, you have all these candidate core sets. So first, you're going to pick the best candidate. You're going to pick the candidate core set that's closest to your input in terms of your MMD. And then you're going to refine it. You're going to take, you're going to remove each point from the core set in turn and replace it with the best point in the input, the point in the input that leads to the smallest MMD. It turns out that each of these steps individually, and so in both steps together, are dominated by just taking these n squared kernel evaluations between pairs of points. So normally, these al this algorithm would run in n squared time, but um, my collaborators Abhishek Shetty and Raz Duvetti and I have developed a um, a generic algorithm for speeding up compression algorithms. And so if you take this n squared type time algorithm and you pass it into this this meta algorithm called compress plus plus then you can make that um, algorithm basically linear time, n log cube n time instead. And similarly, the space would normally cost the minimum of n times d, which is this, the amount of space it requires to store your whole data set, or n squared, the amount of space it requires to store kernel matrix. But if you pass that through the compressed plus plus algorithm, you can get away with square root n, log, uh, square root n d log n space. OK, so let's see this algorithm in action. First, with a very simple example, just to demonstrate some of the properties of the algorithm, here I'm going to compare um, sample uh, uh, discrete approximations to a mixture of Gaussians. So I have a mixture of Gaussians here. It has eight components. I've drawn the equidensity contours for you here. And on the top, I'm showing you what an IID sample looks like from, um, from this mixture of Gaussians. So we have an IID sample of size 8, 16, and 32. And on the bottom, I'm showing you what um, a kernel thinning sample of size 8, 16, and 32 looks like. And what you can see is that even for very small sample sizes, kernel thinning is providing much better stratification across the components of your mixture. So whereas IID sampling will just happen to miss some of the modes just by chance and oversample other modes, because you're doing this oversampling and then, and then compression, you can, you can ensure that you're actually hitting all the modes without actually exactly knowing where the modes are. And then as you get more and more points, what you find is that you have less clumping and fewer gaps than you would from an IID sample. So here I'm still like grossly undersampling this mode, even though I now have 32 points. And here I'm getting a much more balanced allocation of my sample points with kernel thinning. Okay, and that was a visual demonstration, but if you compute the metrics, which you can in this case here, I'm using a Gaussian kernel and I have a mixture of Gaussians target. So it can actually exactly compute that MMD measure that we're aiming to optimize, then you can see that um, uh, kernel thinning samples are providing both a better rate of convergence. So here's my rate of convergence. It's n to the minus 1 half for d equals 2. Um, and it's n to the minus 1 quarter for IID sampling. That's what we would expect. You're getting a better rate of convergence. And on top of that, you're just getting a, an improvement in the magnitude of MMD. So even for four points, even when I'm just sampling four points, I'm still seeing an improvement in the MMD. And now that's for dimension 2. And, but even as we go into higher dimensions, 4, 10, even 100, even for 100 dimensions and a very small number of points, I'm seeing a significant improvement in both the rate and the actual value of the MMD. And Lester, in the previous slide, what was the initial number of points that you, because you used uh, yeah, eight points yeah. in the beginning or, or you used much more set of points and then you did this thinning thing, right? Oh, great. Yeah. So throughout, whenever I do kernel thinning, I'm going to be using n to square root n. So I'm always using, so for 8, I'm, I'm starting with 64. So I'm always like okay. drawing an IID okay. sample. In this case, I'm drawing an IID sample of size n, and then I'm shrinking it down to square root n. So 8 here is, is square root n. I see. Great question. And that's, and that's true here as well. So of course, it's size is square root n, and I'm starting with n input points. Okay, so here's a more in, uh, interesting example, I think. Now we're doing posterior inference for systems of ordinary differential equations. So now your target P is going to be a posterior distribution over the parameters of a coupled, um, a coupled system of ODEs. And we'll look at three different examples. We'll look at what's called the Goodwin model of oscillatory enzymatic control. We'll also consider the Lotka-Volterra model of predator-prey evolution.
And then finally, we'll look at this hinge model of cardiac ca calcium sigma. And that's the model I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that gives you a 38 dimensional posterior. And remember now, we're going to quantify the uncertainty in the signaling model, but our ultimate goal, our downstream goal, is to propagate that uncertainty through your whole heart simulation. And this means that every point that's left over is gonna take us, um, you know, it's gonna trigger an 1,000 CPU hour um, whole heart simulation. And so every point that we can discard, it leads to a big reduction in downstream costs. All right, and so we're gonna also consider, whoa, triggered some sort of end of talk key. Well, okay, so we're also gonna consider a variety of different MCMC algorithms, the Gaussian random walk, an adaptive random walk, a metropolis adjusted Langevin algorithm called MALA and a preconditioned MALA algorithm. I'll just highlight that even the MCMC collection stage can be expensive. So for the, for the Hinch model, it took us two weeks of CPU time just to generate the input chain, which is at length 4 million. And the time that we spend compressing compared to that is, is basically negligible. So let's take a look at some results. So on each of these rows represents a different target, Goodwin, Laka, Volterra, Hinch. Um, what you can see already from the Goodwin and Laka, Volterra cases are that, well, standard thinning. So what I'm showing in red is standard thinning. This is what you typically do in MCMC. If you want to get down to a target size, square root n, you just take every teeth point. So every square root nth point in this case. And you can see that for these first two models, standard thinning is about what you expect. It's doing you know, basically no better than IID sampling. So maybe like n to the minus one quarter rates. Um, and we see a, a big improvement in the rate of convergence and in the quality of the MMD from doing kernel thinning instead. That's the blue line. In the hinge case, something interesting happens. Standard thinning is already doing a pretty good job. And there's a reason for this that we can talk about, but standard thinning is already doing a pretty good job, um, giving you a pretty fast rate of convergence. But even then, kernel thinning is still providing an improvement and an improvement that is um, significant for our downstream costs. So for instance, here we're using half as many points to get to the same level of MMD quality, which means that um, which means that we can spend half as much time um, doing heart simulations and each one costs us a thousand CPU hours. So this seems like a good solution. We've, we've achieved our goals. We've been able to compress further than we could normally, but there's actually something wrong with this picture and something that you can't tell just by looking at these plots. And what's wrong is that well, these hinge chains, these hinge Markov chains haven't actually mixed. That is the input point sets that we're using um, for the hinge Markov chains that come from hinge Markov chains haven't mixed well. And how do I know that? Well, I ran two independent copies of those hinge Markov chains. And on the right here, I'm plotting their, um, their marginal distributions. So they're 38 dimensional, so I can't show you the joint distribution, but I can show you the margin, the marginals for each coordinate. And what you can see is that these basically the marginals are not even overlapping in most of these cases, which is a bad sign. You know, they're supposed to be approximating, representing the same distribution and they're not even overlapping. What's happening? Well, each of these chains is basically getting stuck in a different local mode, which is one indication that the chains haven't been run long enough to actually mix, mix completely. So that's a bad, that's a problem because we're relying on the input to be a good approximation of our target. So what do you normally do in such a case? Well, a common solution is to replace the true target P with a, a surrogate, a more diffuse, what's called tempered posterior, and then to run your Markov chain to, to target that surrogate. Now, that's a reasonable solution. That's something that you can do and that we will do, but it leads to a new sort of problem. That tempering is now going to introduce a persistent bias into your, into your inference because your MCMC points are now gonna be summarizing this wrong distribution, P tilde, instead of the true distribution P. So a natural question is then, if we're doing this compression anyway, and we're doing this compression to provide a good approximation to P, can we correct these biases while we're doing compression? And this is not the only situation in which such a thing might, in which you might want to do bias correction with your compression. So this is, this is coming from tempering, you may be doing another sort of off-target sampling. For instance, this comes up when you're doing what's called approximate MCMC, when you're running a chain that doesn't quite target the right distribution because it's more convenient computationally. And it also occurs from something called burn-in. When you're running your Markov chain, typically you don't know where the bulk of your probability distribution is yet. You start at an arbitrary place, 
and your chain has to find its way to the bulk of the probability distribution. But because of that, you end up with this tail of points, which really has nothing to do with your target. It just has to do with your starting point. And that's called the, those are burn-in points. And you'd like to remove those points before doing inference because, well, they're unrelated to the target inference. And that's another sort of bias that you'd like to remove. Now, the difficulty with bias correction is that you, it's insufficient to just look at your input point set. You need some additional information about the target P in order to effectively remove these biases. So to deal with this, we're going to go back to the drawing board. We're going to look again at the quality measure that we've been using to um, design our compression schemes. Now, so far, we've been using this MMD to measure the difference between PN and Q, their input and, and Q. But instead of look, measuring the PN, we're now going to start to try to measure it directly to P. Let's measure distance directly to the target distribution P. But that turns out is it's a difficult thing to do. And it's difficult because, well, you can always rewrite your MMD as just a series of expectations of your kernel function, um, expectations under Q and under P. And this highlights the difficulty because in order to compute an MMD exactly, you need to know how to take compute the expectation of your kernel under P. But typically, integration under P is intractable. The whole reason why we're forming these sample, these sample approximations is because we don't know how to integrate under P, which means that um, P of K and the MMD based on P can't be computed exactly in practice for most kernels. So how do we get around this? Well, one idea is to only consider kernels that we know a priori have mean zero under the target distribution P. If we could do that, then we would get rid of these PK terms, and we'd be, we'd be left with a computation that only depends on Q. And that's fine because expectations under Q are easy. They're just sample averages. So we know how to compute that. So we're going to run with this idea. And this idea is exactly what uh, motivates this, um, this class of metrics called Kernelstein discrepancies, or KSDs for short. KSDs, it turns out, are just special MMDs with special kernels that are a priori constructed to have mean zero under the target distribution P. Specifically, the most common kernels have this form I've written here. You don't need to really take away anything about that form beyond this fact that it only depends on your target distribution through the gradient of its log density. So now we're going to focus on targets that actually have log densities. But if you have such a target, this, this kernel can be constructed in a way that only depends on the gradient of the log density, which is something that's computable even when the normalization constant um, of that density is unknown. And it turns out that under some mild conditions, for instance, if your grad log P is integrable, then the expectation of this kernel is zero under P, which is exactly what we want because that means that we don't have to worry about computing expectations under P anymore. We can just um, compute sample averages in order to evaluate this MMD. Okay, that's great. So we have a metric that's computable now, but you might wonder, what is this thing how does it relate to metrics that we've, we care about that we've seen before? And can we still metrize convergence like we were in the prior part of this talk where we were using standard MMDs based on Gaussian kernels, for instance? Well, um, my collaborators and I have been investigating this question, and we have found um, some sufficient conditions under which these, M these kernel Stein discrepancies still metrize weak convergence or still control weak convergence. So for instance, if you use as your base kernel one of these inverse multi-quadric kernels, and if your target distribution has strongly log concave tails, so it doesn't have to be a strongly log concave distribution, it actually can do somewhat arbitrary things in the center of its distribution, but its tails should be strongly log concave. And if it has a Lipschitz grad log P, then whenever your MMD goes to zero, then you're guaranteed that your, um, your core set is, a, is converging to the true distribution P in distribution. So you still get that um, distribution control. Okay, so what are we going to do with these kernel Stein discrepancies? Well, we have an algorithm called Stein thinning for doing compression with, uh, with a KSD. And essentially what we're going to do is we're just going to greedily minimize the kernel Stein discrepancy using points from the input set. So I still have my input set coming from my MCMC algorithm. I'm going to form a compressed set, and this is how I'll do it. First, I'm going to choose the single point out of my set that provides the best approximation to my target distribution in terms of my KSD. Okay, and now on every subsequent round, I'm going to add in one more point. And I'm just going to add in the one input point that, again, 
minimizes my, my distance to P in terms of this measure that we can now compute explicitly. And so the same point might be selected multiple times, that's fine. Um, the runtime in the worst case is n s squared. So if s again is square root n, you're thinking about a quadratic runtime again. And so what do we know about the quality of this algorithm? Well, here's a guarantee um, from our work. It says um, you can bound the MMD, you can bound the Kernel-Stein discrepancy of this procedure Stein thinning in terms of two terms. Now the second term is really no better than the sort of decay that you'd see from doing IID sampling. But this first term is much more interesting because this first term says that Stein thinning performs nearly as well as the best simplex reweighting of your input point set. Okay, before we were just saying we want to do nearly as well as the input. Now we're saying we're doing the best, nearly as well as the best reweighting of the input. And so this means you're gonna perform nearly as well as your Markov chain after you, after you removed all the burn-in. Because I can always assign a weight of zero to all the burn-in points and equal weight to the remaining points, and that's an, a valid simplex reweighting. So I'm gonna perform nearly as well as that. It also means I can perform nearly as well as an off-target sample, so sample from the wrong distribution, after I've done optimal important sampling reweighting, even though I haven't computed the important sampling weights. So that's perfect for these tempered posteriors, that's sort of um, the problem that motivated um, this procedure in the first place. Uh, so here's a more formal version of that second statement. So for instance, if your input point set was drawn IID, ooh, if your input point set was drawn IID from the wrong distribution, P tilde, then under mild conditions, which are just your standard important sampling type conditions, then Stein thinning, your Stein thinning corrected compressed um, point set is going to converge to P, even though your input was coming from the wrong distribution. And that will happen almost shortly as, as your input point set goes to infinity. And the same sort of result extends to sufficiently ergodic Markov chains targeting P tilde. And you can check out our paper for more of those details. So um, as we'll quickly show you a couple of examples of Stein thinning in action. First, correcting for burn-in. Um, here is Here's one of the trajectories from uh, that Goodwin posterior that we were, we were investigating earlier. Here's a Markov chain run. What I want to highlight here is that I'm, I'm plotting um, the sequence of points generated by a Markov chain projected into two dimensions. And the bulk of the distribution that I'm targeting is in this little gray box, which means that the chain is actually spending half of its time just trying to find its way to the bulk of the distribution. And all of these points outside of that box should be thrown away and discarded as burn-in. And so what usually an inference, usually if you're doing um, posterior inference, this is what you do. You'll, you'll run a bunch of different Markov chains and try to find in the right, try to find the right burn-in level based on where those Markov chains uh, meet. And then you'll end up throwing away most of these points and then you'll subsample um, using standard thinning points in this box. So that's the standard way of doing this. Alternatively, you could give the entire Markov chain to Stein thinning and just say, do some compression for me. And it also will pick points only in this box because it, it realizes by, look, by actually checking the MMD, by checking the KSD, that these other points are not useful for approximating the distribution P well. And so you end up with a, a similar result, but actually, um, as I'll show in the next slide, a, a higher quality result. Um, just a so here, um, here's a more quantitative result now focusing on correcting for tempering instead of correcting for burn-in. This is going back to our, our cardiac hinge model as, as we were talking about at the very beginning. I'm comparing a few different things here. Um, in black, I'm showing you a standard compression procedure called support points. And it's, um, it's also formed by starting with a Markov chain and compressing it down to a small set of points. But if you run a Markov chain for this hinge posterior and you compress it, you end up getting a bad approximation to the target. And the reason why in this case is simply because your Markov chain hasn't mixed well. The same problem that we ran into earlier. So what can you do? Well, instead, we're going to run a Markov chain that does mix well, that's targeting um, a tempered posterior, which is not, the, it's not exactly the target, but it's related to the target. And so you can imagine running that Markov chain and just compressing it directly using support points. In that case, you get an even worse approximation because there's this persistent bias between the tempered posterior and your true target. But if you do the tempering, if you run your tempered chain and you pass it through Stein points, which corrects for the biases as you do your compression, then you get an increasingly good approximation of your target. 
which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so I've shared a lot. Um, and just to summarize, I've introduced these two new tools for summarizing a probability distribution more effectively than IID sampling or standard MCMC thinning. The first was kernel thinning, which compresses an endpoint summary into a square root endpoint summary with better than IID approximation error. And the second is Stein thinning, which simultaneously wraps in bias correction while doing compression. And this is useful for off-target sampling and tempering and dealing with burn-in. And something I didn't really mention much, but is working under the hood is this meta algorithm called Compress++ plus plus that speeds up any thinning algorithm without ruining its quality. And so if you wanna learn more about any of this work, I've put some links to papers and also to the packages so you could try out the code with uh, the problems that you're working on. And thank you. Thank you for your time. And let me know, please, if you have any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Lester, for your very uh, nice presentation. And uh, for sure, I will need to listen to the recording again to <laughs> understand it even better. Uh, also, let me just uh, move to this question part of our seminar by by uh, by saying the word from uh, Christoph Ley, who asked me to send greetings to you and uh, regret he regrets that he cannot couldn't be available in person today because of some interview that he had uh, mm -hmm. but uh, he will for sure listen to the recording fantastic so whoever now wants to ask question just switch on your microphone or perhaps also video and ask questions Hi Lester, thanks for the nice talk. Hello. Yeah, as Jakub said, I guess I have to. We have to go through it again to understand it nicely. Uh, but still, a quick question. You said up uh, said that uh, in order to get this MMD, you have to. You cannot get the expectation of the P, and therefore you apply a constraint where you set the means to zero. And doesn't that uh, doesn't that restriction in, causes the lack of uh, uh, errors? I mean, I, it, I could not follow the intuition there. You're applying some hard constraint yeah. and I'm supposed that should affect the quality of the final integration. Ah, so I'm not actually applying any constraint, but what I'm doing is figuring out, what I'm doing is selecting my kernel well. Um, so what do you like? So in some sense, whenever you're computing an MMD, Mm -hmm. um, you can you you can think of your you can think of your kernel as being a mean zero kernel under p because you can always just take your original kernel and essentially subtract off the mean under p and that, that will give you another kernel. Um, yeah. But the problem is that typically that that you know mean centered kernel isn't computable for the reason I just mentioned, which is you you don't know how to compute the expectation of the kernel under p. And so if, even if you subtract it off pk, that's not something you can actually work with in practice. And so what we're doing is we're we're figuring out how to choose a kernel that we know the mean of under P. And then we're gonna work with that kernel for the, as the basis of the MMD, because you have this, in your MMD, you do have a degree of freedom, which is the kernel itself. Oh, okay. And so we're gonna to pick it. special kernels that we know essentially how to integrate under P. And on the next slide here, I, I'm, I'm giving you an example of one such kernel. Um, it's called, the, we call it the Langevin-Stein kernel. Um, and Basically, you you pass your kernel through this operator, which is basically the sort of operator that you often see in Stein's method. You pass it through this operator, and the operator has this property that when you integrate this the, the result kp under p, it's mean zero. Um, and you can check that by basically doing integration by parts. Okay, yeah, thanks. That explains. Great. Um, maybe I'll ask a question. I, I'm, I'm hesitating because maybe it will reveal that I'm missing the, the whole idea entirely, but that's okay. That's okay. I, would, I would ask it. <laughs> so uh, when, when you have the, your measure of discrepancy, that is a basis of uh, comparing different algorithms that are possible, uh, in particular the one of yours, uh, then, then you are referring, let's say you need to sample somehow the your, your distribution, your posteriors, and uh, you, you need to have some con reference or the exact solution. You don't have an exact solution, but you, you need to have some something to, with respect to which you are comparing your uh, your synth 
model. And uh, in high dimensional spaces, you can have a, a really huge amount of sampling points necessary to properly uh, sample your distributions. Uh, but still, you probably what you are using is you are using this n squared or n points uh, that are uh, used before thinning as your reference, or you are doing something completely else that I haven't captured here. Yeah, so there how, how do you measure this discrepancy, and how how right. how uh, confident this measurement is? How can you be confident about it? So that's okay. That's a wonderful question. So. Technically, I was doing two different things in the two parts of the talk. So in the kernel thinning part, um, in the first part of the talk, we were comparing ourselves directly to the input. So your input, you generate an input from a Markov chain. You know, you have a Markov chain that's targeting this calcium signaling model, for instance. And now your goal is just to approximate that, that input well. Um, so whenever we computed MMDs or wherever we were even doing the compression in the first part of the talk, we we're just comparing directly to that input set, input point set. And what we can guarantee is that your approximation error to that input is very small. So if the input is also a good approximation to the target, to the true P, then your, then your compression will be a good approximation. That's what we're relying on in the first part. But, okay. in the second, but in the second part of the talk, in this part in the slide that's mentioned here, we're actually not measuring um, distance to, the, to any um, point set. We're actually measuring distance directly to the target distribution P um, without having to use a surrogate input to, to measure that distance. And the reason we can do this is because we've constructed the metric so that we can exactly compute the distance to P. Um, yeah, that, that's the reason. <laughs> so your, your target distribution is a sort of uh, assumed distribution, that, like in the variation? variation yeah, so, so it's like in posterior inference. inference. So you, yeah, so you know the posterior, you know the density, but only up to a normalization constant. and what you use about that posterior in this case is um, the gradient of the log density. So that's like the only information that comes in about your distribution is the gradient of the log density. But that's something that you often have if you're doing MCMC for a continuous distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I probably I will look uh, at one of your, your papers to, to understand it in a more detail. Sure. Thanks. Okay, and any comments or questions? Okay, so probably currently there are no ideas or questions uh, from the audience, uh, but again, this uh, recording will be available to the people who couldn't attend the seminar today at this time. Uh, so, so probably you can imagine that somebody can contact you in the future uh, yeah. about your talk. So thank you so much, Lester, for preparing this uh, topic and showing it to us today. And thank you everybody for your attention. Uh, so feel invited next week for our seminar. Uh, this time at 10 a.m. Unfortunately, Lester, but <laughs> CT, 8 a.m. CT, and and yeah, and goodbye. Have a good have a good day to everybody. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Uh,